How y'all doing today? My name is Trevor Grant. I am a, uh, and welcome to Mahoot and Kubeflow together at last. Um, a quick overview of this talk. Um, and um, we'll do who am I? I meant to delete that, I, but I will probably be freeforming for a minute, doing some fills. Um, we'll do a little background on what is Mahoot, what is Spark, what is Kubeflow. This will actually, this isn't even up to date. I worked so hard on my slides, I forgot to update my agenda. This is more or less correct, but that's fine. Um, and there'll be a lot of shameless plugs for the, especially the book and a couple for the article throughout the uh, talk. Um, so who am I? Who am I? Um, I work at a lot of places, but for whatever purposes, I am the CTO of my own whatever company, which has a naming schema similar to Ubuntu with, yeah, my first one, Aboriginal Armadillo. Also an O'Reilly author, um, co-author of the upcoming Kubeflow for Machine Learning from Lab to Production. You will hear about that lots throughout this and the demo that we talk about throughout the uh, back end of this is actually chapter nine in the book and there's an uh, article about it. Um, I'm a PMC of Apache Mahout and Apache Streams and Apache Community Dev. Um, I organized the Mahout track. I also organized the IoT track. I used to do IoT at IBM. Uh, I still work at IBM too. Um, aspiring Chief Mugwug, I appreciate everyone for coming today. I kind of just did a quick fill abstract and bio because it was the last day and I figured, oh, I'll go back and update it later. And I realized last week that I'd forgotten. So you read my bio on this. I'm apparently the aspiring chief mugwug, whatever that may be. Um, ah, yes, the book I promised to plug relentlessly um, is presented. Chapter nine um, is this. This is the book. It's available for pre-sale on Amazon.com right now for, I think, $45. You should all buy it. I think I get quarters per purchase. So got to make that your money somehow. Um, you can ask questions on apachecon.slack. I will also see the questions in the local uh, chat panel. I didn't realize we had that. Um, there is a Mahout channel on apachecon.slack.com. So whatever you're comfortable with, I will check both at the end of this talk. Um, so let's get into it. Tell me more about Apache Spark. Um, considering y'all are at an Apache con, I We'll hope that you know a bit about or have heard of Apache Spark. It's um, a, a quasi-popular Apache project, I'd say at least top 50. Um, very common, well-supported engine for big data ETL. The one-liner, it's in-memory MapReduce, if you haven't heard of it, but you know about Hadoop. Um, there is Spark ML, but where Spark ML lacks is um, robust linear algebra type operations, which happen to be something we needed. Um, and so that's why that's italicized. Specifically, Mahout is, we call it machine learning because we like to, uh, you know, we want to ride that wave of machine learning school, data science, whatever. But really it's uh, distributed linear algebra, and which gives you a lot more power than your typical machine learning because you can quickly and easily implement your own whatever R algorithm you have. Um, and so that's really the value of Mahout. Uh, there we go. So yeah, linear algebra at scale, I guess I was kind of talking ahead of myself. It all like also has, a, it's Scala only. We don't have Python or R bindings. However, Scala allows you to have domain specific languages. Um, and we have this R like domain specific language. And the value in that is if you've ever seen um, uh, algebraic expressions expressed in R, you can, they're not perfect, but you can kind of see, you can follow from like the, the way it's written on like a paper to how it's written in the code, which just makes it a lot easier to transcribe those things. Um, it's not the point of the talk though, but I mean, there's a whole deep dives on that as well. Um, I highly recommend you check it out. It also has, while it runs on a, it's a library that runs on Apache Spark um, or H2O or Flink. You can also write your own back end. Um, and that's um, an important thing. If you have a bunch of data in 
I don't know. I don't know. There's a whole, there's, there's talks on that too. Um, suffice to say it does, we'll be using it as a library on Apache Spark. Um, and most importantly, it can decompose large distributed matrices. Um, and, and we'll get into that in a bit, but that's the, the real value that we wanted for Mahout um, in this pipeline. And what's a pipeline? Well, that's going to be a Kubeflow thing. Kubeflow, if you haven't heard of, and at ApacheCon is the most likely you haven't. Um, this is from their website. But the key points of Kubeflow, again, I wrote the whole book on it. I could probably go on. I can give a full talks on Kubeflow as well. But for the purposes of this talk, it, you can create reproducible machine learning pipelines of Docker containers, which allows you to mix and match your Python, your R, Scala, Java, C code. You got some COBOL hanging out somewhere you want to use, get weird with Pascal, whatever, whatever you want. You can put these in a pipeline. Um, there's a lot of advantages to that. Um, and most importantly for this is this Kubeflow pipeline is packaged and committed to Git. And anyone can pull that, set up a Kubeflow cluster on GCP, tweak a couple of settings, and run the exact same pipeline and get the exact same results. And, you know, science is about, you know, creating reproducible results. Um, and... But another part of that, like, is it's not just like, okay, well, here's what I did. And in theory, you can reproduce your own. This actually, like, no, not only can you reproduce it, here's the code. And in like 30 minutes, you can get the same result. And then you can just see, you know, oh, wait, but you had a negative sign here where it should have been a positive sign or something like that. Or you can further extend it saying, okay, cool. Given those results on, we're going to be using CT scans. I will then put a neural network on these clean CT scans uh, downstream and I'm going to create the next stacks. So it rakes it really, really, um, it's, uh, it's a great product for helping um, facilitate collaboration um, with machine learning and science in general. Uh, but again, I'm giving lots of Kubeflow talks too, and that's not exactly the point of this talk. We want to talk about how we can use them together. Um, some useful data science things you can do in Kubeflow. There's the model serving. You can automate retraining. Um, you kind of have cross-cloud compatibility in the same way that you can just deploy Kubernetes to any cross-cloud. There's, there's tweaks you have to make, but it basically will run in any cloud. Multiple languages in the pipeline, the reproducibility in the pipelines. Um, again, I kind of spoke out ahead of myself. But that's the, I, those were some points I wanted to really, really drive home on this. So let's talk about these pipelines. This is a kind of just sample pipeline. Um, and I believe it's an XG boost run, um, but you'll see, you know, it does, it, it pulls the data in, analyzes it to make sure that it's clean. We'll do the ETL, trains XG boost, can predict, um, you know, whatever, gives you your, your confusion matrix, your rock curve, and then whatever. Um, this is an example. Not all pipelines will be like this, but that's a way you can do a pipeline. That's also good to keep your ETL and your um, your ETL in with the model because changing the ETL can drastically change the model. So being able to keep everything in like as as one asset together is also a very very valuable thing. Um, and then you can. There's also conditional outputs on this. So this for example, might be a conditional, you know, if the confusion matrix meets some um, criteria, then push to production. Otherwise, just don't push it to production and leave the production one alone. Um, there's a lot of cool things you can do with pipelines in this. But again, there and it, there's so many cool things that I can't, I'm, I can't do justice to Kubeflow and all the cool things you can do with the pipelines whilst still covering the other things we want to cover in this. Um, Spark on Kubeflow and really Spark on Kubernetes. I should have, I forgot to write these slides out. Um, there's multiple ways to run Spark on Kubernetes. Um, however, when you're doing so in a Kubeflow pipeline, these are all generally Docker containers or Kubeflow, Kubernetes operators. And your Spark step will be a Kubernetes operator. Um, and so 
that's the short of it. There is some um, tweaking that you can do. You can set your parameters in the YAML file. And again, if you don't, aren't familiar with Kubernetes, I'm sorry, because this is probably flying a bit over your head. Um, and that's okay. You'll, if you, when you start learning about Kubernetes, you will learn about YAML files and configs like that. And that's where you would config, um, you know, how many executors, how many machines you want, cores per executor, memory, and all those fun spark things that we all just love so much. Um, there's more troubles than this, trust me. However, some of the big ones you'll write that um, you wouldn't be thinking about is because it's an operator, it will, it will create a Spark app on each run. Now, if you don't have some sort of logic that like creates like a random five characters on the end of that Spark app name, you'll get a fail on the second run unless you delete the Spark app that gets created. But that doesn't happen automatically. In your YAML file, you'll probably config, you know, the name of your the name of your app. Um, and that'll still be existing as like a done job. And it'll throw an error when you try to um, when you try to run it again. Again, things you just be as have learned the hard way. Um, a PVC is a persistent volume claim. Um, on some Kubernetes, you can allow multiple writes, but like for example, on GCP, you cannot do that. And so if you're, you can't allow multiple writes, you need to write to somewhere else. In our case, we wrote to an S3 bucket. Um, it's not the end of the world, but you know, it's just like one of those things, like I said, it's cross cloud compatible ish. It depends, you know, on a number of things for case in point this, but you know, okay. So you re-aim what you're going to write to and it's, it's all still fairly cross compatible. So chapter nine example in the book and with the journal article um are both talking about though from different perspectives is how to denoise ct scans uh with apache mahout um running on kubeflow so the first question is why would you want to do this um the whole this whole scheme came up in i think march or maybe mid-april um but just some background on just ct scans um CT scans can, you know, they give you very useful diagnostics. Um, you can check for lung cancer. You can look at uh, a lot of things, but doing a full CT scan delivers a high dose of radiation, like a thorax, like a chest CT scan. You can only have about 25 of those in your life, or you run like serious radiation risks. Um, that being said, like chronic smokers, they came up with a way to do a low dose CT scan. Uh, I think in the late nineties, started using it a lot for like testing for lung cancer and it's like uh you know every year you get a, a low dose ct scan now the problem with the low dose ct scan is they're fuzzy and hard to read they call them noisy um uh but you know in the late 90s because they were doing this and they wanted to clean these uh noisy ct scans up they basically they found basically singular value decompositions um and what is really kind of like a principal component analysis is how they figured out to clean those up. But the problem is these CT scans are so large that, and you need to do it on a single machine and it's super memory intensive. I actually tried to do a SVD with Python on a CT scan um, and it griped, it estimated it was gonna need about a half a terabyte of memory. That was back in you know the late 90s, early 2000s. Today, I think the biggest machine you can pull on AWS has about 400 gigabytes. So you can't just do a straight singular value decomposition. However, there's ways to approximate a singular value decomposition with k-means. There's actually a bunch of ways to figure out how to approximate the clean um, COVID scan. One of the major approaches is using, in essence, a singular value decomposition. Um, and, and, it's a, and it's an estimation of it, but that's the gist of what you're trying to do. Um, the I, I was writing this yesterday and thought I'd come back and I got kind of spicy at the FDA, but the gist of it is the FDA stuck their fingers in it and said, no, 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 you can't just do this. You have to clear everything with us. So companies make a point. Well, even though there's plenty of research on how to do this, you have to pay a company who's paid to have their appliance cleared with the FDA to make sure that it's okay for cleaning CT scans. 
this is an artifact and a problem of our healthcare system, but it is what it is. Um, and so the problem for researchers is how do we clean these low dose CT scans? Best case scenario, whoever took them has already cleaned them up and you're getting clean ones. It's not always the case. Um, but that also might seem like, okay, weird corner case, still, why are we doing this? Well, in April, um, there was some research already showing that CT scans were in some cases better um, predictors of COVID than the RT-PCR test. That's like the blood test. Um, research since then has actually shown that and there's like guidance now on when you should use CT scans versus when you should just be okay with RT-PCR. Um, and in the you know post-COVID world, FDA is pretty much off the table. You can, you, we don't have to, you know, bribe off the FDA to make COVID tests um, and a lot of other things. So the idea here was let's create a way for hospitals to be able to do their low dose CT scans and not have to pay whoever to clean them. Because like in developing areas, in areas where it's not fe fiscally feasible, helping them prevent the scans, we should it would be nice if they had a way to do low dose CT scans is the short of the long of this. Um, and also AI researchers, I've been looking, you know, are looking at like making convolutional neural nets on CT scans to see if they can uh, detect COVID and all these things. So that's big picture. The gist of what we were hoping for here is to be able to give researchers a way they could denoise their CT scans and they could do it by just spinning up you know, either GCP or an AWS Kubeflow cluster um, and doing this for, you know, if on, on large batches, you do them for like, you know, like 100 CT scans, you could do them for nickels each as opposed to, I don't even know what the healthcare costs are, but I'm sure it's high, especially when FDA bribes come into play. Uh, and again, sorry to be so spicy at the FDA, but there it is. Um, CT scans of, so where do we get these CT scans? There was a thing called coronacases.org, which has about 11 scans um, uh, collected by a Brazilian person, I think. And then it was taken down and then I looked yesterday and it's back up. So I don't know if you're interested, go get them and it's whatever. But if you just want to play with this in general to make sure you can build a useful thing, you can also just download CT, CT scans, DICOM. And you can get lots of archives like lung cancer, various um, ailments, just find some thorax CT scans, really anything in DICOM files. You want to find DICOM files. Um, there's lots of things they can CT scan. And the math works basically the same anyway. Um, and so, yeah, lots of data sets out there. So go nuts. So the pipeline that we built. Um, and again, the value here is this is repeatable and transferable. Any hospital in a remote area that doesn't have access to whatever, as long as they have an internet connection on a reasonable speed, they can clone and build this and run it um, and, and be checking their own and denoising their own CT scans. Or people can say, hey, cool idea, except you screwed up your math right here. And I don't know how any of this worked, but cool. Or people can say, hey, I want to do some neural nets on CT scans of COVID patients but I wanted the CT scans clean first. They can take this and just add another operator here at the end. So that's the value of like why we built this pipeline. Um, and we're gonna go through the individual components one by one. The first one is, you know, you need a requisition of PV, a, a persistent volume container, and you're gonna wanna download your data. And I was storing my data in um, the DICOMs in just an S3 bucket, but if, you have your own DICOMs and you can just build your own, you just put them in your own S3 bucket and you can re-aim to that. And I think I even made it as a passable parameter to which S3 bucket you wanted. So that's the, um, now to convert the DICOM. So this, um, this is a Docker container. This is a Docker container that downloads the DICOMs into the PVC. This PVC gets mounted as a volume on each of these Docker containers. Um, the first one, actually, no, just on these two Docker containers. Um, 
So we download all of the DICOMs into this persistent volume container. Now this one, this Docker container, and it's been a minute since I've looked at it, but as I recall, takes maybe a specific image like DICOM file, but a DICOM file really is like a folder and it's an array of images and each image you can convert to a vector. And again, we're using PyDICOM here. And that's why I use the Python because there's already a library, great. Don't have to reinvent the wheel, figuring out how to parse out DICOM files. PyDICOM loaded up. Um, you can extract the data and there's some metadata too that you can save, um, but it basically just stretches these. Um, an image can be stretched out into a vector. And then since a DICOM is really like, it's a 3D image. So it's, you know, you can imagine any 3D image as a stack of other images. Um, and that's, and that's really all a CAT scan is then. So each image, two dimensional images flattened to a one dimensional vector. And then you have a stack of one dimensional vectors, which gives you a two dimensional matrix. Perfect. Um, I think there's some parameters for the DICOM size and the metadata too. Um, but again, these are things that you can pass and, and Kubeflow allows you to pass these like metadata parameters, um, which you might use for like whatever machine learning algorithm, but you can also set them as like parameters for like pre-processing your data. <clears throat> now, since it's a Mahout track, this is, I think the only code I'm gonna show, but this is how hard it is to do a um, district, distributed stochastic singular value decomposition, which is a function that Mahout ships with. Um, Path to matrix is a file that gets passed in, um, though I believe it's, just hard coded here. Like it just default, like s.txt, default s.txt or something like that. At any rate, it splits that matrix up. We got it. We, we now have a, we have a, a distributed row matrix of the voxels is a uh, It's industry jargon in the DICOMs, but a voxel is what this matrix is. Um, these are hyperparameters, which again can be set and tuned. There's a um, good paper, uh, Halco wrote a, wrote the paper that was the basis for this distributed stochastic, um, the distributed singular value decomposition. Um, that, the rank of the, it's kind of a little bit mathy to get into right now, but suffice to say there are some hyperparameters. And then it spits out two, um, you, the left and the right side of the decomposed matrix, and then the eigenvalues down the center. And so in essence, to put this back together into an output DICOM. Um, this algorithm also arranges the uh, vectors um, into or into decrease in like order of decreasing importance. So you can just say, okay, cool. Like I think I set this to maybe three hundred, um, you know, basis vectors. And so you just maybe take you know the first two hundred and ninety, and that actually since it's three, let's say there's a hundred of them. If there's 100, you take the first 90, that means you denoise 10%. That's again, kind of sloppy, but that's the gist of what it is. And so the idea is those least important vectors are really probably just the white noise because originally, and I forgot to put this up at the top, but I talk about it more in the journal article, you have a clean image plus noise. So the, the image you see is the result of a clean image plus some noise. And you're trying to solve for the clean image. So those last basis vectors are really just the noise, uh, or so we hope. And so you want to be able to turn off those vectors until you get a more sharp image. Um, and it might be, um, well, well, we'll show this. So I, I put them back together. I made a, I just made images like a JPEGs to spit out. However, and you can easily change this for your use, you can output a clean DICOM file or you can output a bunch of JPEGs, like one for each level. Um, or you can just use this as a pre-processing step to do further analysis, whatever you wanna do. Again, one of the beauties of Kubeflow is this optionality. Um, so again, this is just one of the slices. I think this was 5% denoised, but you can see a lot more things like kind of popping up like here, there and everywhere. Um, for, and, and it's again, the exact same original. I, I believe that this is the ground glass occlusions that um, are the telltales of uh, COVID. This was one of the COVID patients. Um, 
but again, I just took this like slice out. You are you can put together a full DICOM file or whatever you need to do for your output. Um, so shameless plug. How am I doing on time? I think one fifteen. I started maybe one thirty. Okay, yeah, I'm about. I got to be about right. Any rate, forty five pre sale on Amazon. Ask for it for Christmas. Ask for Hanukkah. Ask for your birthday. Give it to your friends and enemies for their birthday, Hanukkah, and Christmas too. Donate copies to charity. Uh, nickels per copy sold. I need your money, so please buy my book if you really want to. I might be able to get, even. I might even be able to get you a code to, to get a bit of a discount on it, um, and thus cutting even further into my ever so narrow profit margin because they already don't pay very much to write books, and we're splitting this five ways. So let me tell you, it's margins are thin out there, but. If you uh, enjoy it, then it's worth it to me. Also, uh, this was published, I think, just, I think, in the last couple of weeks, finally. Um, this, so chapter nine in the book will give you a very in-depth, it's like a how-to technical of how to set up the Kubeflow pipeline. The article goes into the math, why this is a good idea, you know, like that, like why, lo, like more background on low-dose radiation um, CT scans, what we're trying to accomplish here and sort of just gives a nod of the hat that like, yeah, here's this, here's the method we use and here's how we did it. And here's our results. Um, so more people download that and I guess I get prestige. So check that out too. Um, this is my first journal article. It was a big day. All right. So with that, we'll go to uh, the conclusions are, I don't know, use Kubeflow in the hoot. Um, stick around for the rest of all the talks. We really enjoy seeing you here. And with that, I will go to questions. that off nope yeah nope well all right yeah questions nothing in the main let's check slack nothing in slack oh man i nailed it on time good for me um so if there are no questions i'll keep on for another minute but um everybody make sure to go see andrew musselman on um oh let's see in a different slack um and andrew palumbo asked about open mp i don't know man if you want open mp write the back end um all these videos i'm hoping will be on the mahout website we are i don't know if we have officially announced but we will very quickly that um, we've got a release that's been voted on. I know it's been a long time. That's another upcoming talk, so I don't want to uh, spoil too much there. So thanks everyone for coming. I really do appreciate it, especially with my horrible, horrible abstract that said absolutely nothing and looked like it was a joke talk. So I do appreciate everyone coming out. Feel free to reach out on, again, the Mahout Slacks or the mailing list. Stick around for the rest of the talks. We really appreciate you being here. And uh, we'll see you all over at the next session which was um, the next session is uh, Andrew Musselman, and uh, he'll be talking about running Mahout on Zeppelin, which, though we've had out for a while, we now have a cool new Docker container, which makes it all a lot smoother. So thanks again, and we'll see you at the next one.